Father God in heaven, we truly, from deep within our hearts, we exalt you and we exalt your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's seated at your right hand in glory today. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you, that you open up the windows of heaven, that you pour out your spirit, that you pour out your Holy Spirit through our worship, through our study, through the preaching, through the fellowship. Lord, do your great and mighty work in us. Father, if there be anyone here that's here this morning and they don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that they will see why they need to bow their knee, why they need to worship, why they need to surrender their life to you. And Father, for the saints of God, I pray that they are encouraged and they walk out of here with a new song, knowing what authentic worship looks like. In the mighty name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen. 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 You may have a seat. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It is great to see you guys. It is great to be in fellowship. Man, and I, I felt like as we were worshiping, man, it was just, that was amazing worship just to exalt the name of the Lord our God. And in day and age when we're living in, the, the times that we're living in, we need to know what it looks like to live a life of authentic worship before our God and before our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say thank you very much this morning to all you guys for giving me the opportunity to share the word with you this morning. I don't take it for granted. I study every week. I study my heart out, and I pray, and I seek the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, show me how to share this, what to say, and Lord, guide me through this study because, I, guys, I want you guys to be blessed. And, and the only way you can be blessed is by getting into the word and getting into worship. So turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. As I said last Sunday, uh, March 1st of 2020, we began our verse-by-verse study through the book of Hebrews. And guess what? It's coming to a close this morning. We will finish the book of Hebrews. I hope you have been blessed by the study. I hope you have been challenged. I hope you see the deep richness of the Jewish foundation that the gospel has been placed upon. Um, And just very thankful for the Old Testament, for the New Testament. The New Testament, of course, founded on the, uh, the New Testament founded, of course, on the Old Testament and the promises of the Messiah to come. And so the, the author of Hebrews, which I have not said this, I wanted to wait till today, but I'm going to show you in Hebrews chapter 13 why, why I believe Paul wrote this book. But it's, it's up for debate, but I'll, I'll show that to you um, in our text this morning. So let's take a look at it. Let's get, to get your minds oriented in the right direction. Let's look at the first two verses that we'll be looking at this morning. And they are Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. It says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to him. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Lord, thank you for your word as we dive into it now. Father, feed us. Your servants were listening, teach us, disciple us, and um, help us to understand your word. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. So this morning we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, going verses 15 through 25, and the title of my message is Authentic Worship. Authentic Worship. Now, when you hear worship, what comes to mind? Many people think, yeah, Blake, many people think uh, what, what takes place on Sunday morning, and that is worship. What we do on Sunday morning is worship, but it's so much more than that. Worship is a lifestyle, and worship is something that you can do Monday through Friday. We are called to live a life of worship before the Lord seven days a week. A good definition of the word worship, if you look through the Bible, you won't find a definition of worship. What you see is the concept of worship, and you see people worshiping. So here's my definition of the word worship. Worship is an expression of adoration and service to God by a believer that loves Christ and desires to exalt the Lord in his life. So it is worship, it is singing, it is Sunday morning, but it's also, um, it takes place throughout the week. You are worshiping throughout the week. The only question is, who are you worshiping? You know, are we worshiping Christ with our lives or are we worshiping ourselves? 
And I hope as a believer that your heart's desire is to to grow and to be a wholehearted worshiper of God 24-7, seven days a week. At the heart of worship is singing his praises, exalting Christ, and here it is, guys, making the gospel of Jesus Christ the center of your life. That is worship, okay? Worship takes place when you get saved, when you become born again, when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you give your life to him. That is an act of worship. You're turning your life over to the one who created it all. So that is at the heart of worship. In America, I believe, authentic worship has been robbed of its meaning. You know, worship is, is something, when people hear the word worship, they think worship is something that we do on Sunday mornings. You know, it's tur- worship is turned into, unfortunately, a spectator's event. We come to church, we watch, we observe, we judge. It's external. It's something done for us and to us rather than something done by us, through us, and from us. The mindset for many is when they go to church and they go to worship is, what can I get out of this? And my friend, don't, don't misunderstand me. Worship is very beneficial to the believer, okay? It's very beneficial to us, and it ministers to us. But the ultimate reason we worship is for God. It's for God to receive the glory, God to receive the honor, and God to receive the worship. You know, many times we, we, we leave church. I do this every single Sunday. I'm guilty every single Sunday. What do I ask you going down the road as soon as we leave church? I say, how was my sermon? How was my teaching? Yes, your pastor asked his wife that on the way home from church. How was worship? And I asked my wife, how was it? And sometimes we, we can ask that question about praise and worship. But the real question we should be asking is, instead of what did I get from that worship or, or was I pleased with the worship, the real question is, God, were you pleased with the worship? That's the real question. That's the heart of worship. So this morning we are looking at the elements of authentic worship. Now I just want to just give you a heads up as we go through these verses. I am going to drill down deep in verses 15 and 16. 80 percent, maybe even 90, 85 percent of this message is going to be on verses 15 and 16. And then we're going to zoom out and look through the rest of the closing benediction of the Apostle Paul. So, the elements of worship. Let's look at it. Verse 15. Verse 15 says, through him. Through him. I want to stop right there when it says in verse 15. It says, through him then. This, my friend, is how you worship. This is how you worship. It's through him. The first element of authentic worship you need to understand is it is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You cannot offer acceptable worship to the Father apart from the Son. It has to be in the Son. You cannot worship God through Hare Krishna, through Muhammad, or through Buddha. It doesn't work that way. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone. It says there in verse 15, look at the verse. It says, through him. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What comes next? And most of you know, I hear it. No one comes to the Father except by me. So it's exclusively through the Lord Jesus Christ. We come through Christ or we don't come at all, is what the text says, is what the New Testament teaches. Acts 4.12 says there is salvation. This is just hammered, hammered over and over throughout each New Testament book. Acts 4.12 says there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It's to him, it's through him, and it's in him. Okay? So we worship through Jesus. That's how we worship. The next question we have to ask ourselves is when do we worship? Well, if we just continue on in the verse, it says, then let us continually offer up. The second element of authentic worship is is, is continual, my friend. Look at the verse for yourself. It's continual. It's not just Sundays. It continues 
throughout the week, throughout the week, in our lives, in our hearts, we say, Christ, you are so good. You are so great. You are so magnificent. I'm not only going to praise you on Sunday, but I'm going to praise you Monday through Friday and Saturday. That's, it's continual. It's throughout our life. Psalms 113 verse 3 says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. We can worship him in the mornings when we wake up and we open up our Bibles and we study the word and we spend time in his presence. To the setting of the sun, that's a reference to evening, morning and evening. You can worship him in the morning, you can worship him in midday, you can worship him in the evening by opening your Bible, by speaking the name Jesus and calling upon him. You can do it at church. You can do it at your bedside. You can uh, do it at the coffee table. You can, you can do it everywhere. Psalms 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He owns everything. He's omniscient, omnipresent. He's everywhere. He will meet you wherever you're at. Geographically, on planet earth to spend time with him. And you and I, we're called to offer up praises every day. So when do we worship? We worship every day. How do we worship? We worship through Christ. Now, we might ask the question, what is worship? What is worship? Well, let's look at verse 15 here. It says, the next phrase. It says, through him let us continually offer up, there it is, a sacrifice of praise. The third element I present to you this morning of, of what authentic worship is is it is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. In, in the Old Testament, bulls and lambs were presented as sacrifices at the tabernacle, at the temple, for the forgiveness of sin. How do we find our forgiveness of sin? Jesus. Jesus has fulfilled what those bulls and lambs did. He has sacrificed himself at the cross of Calvary for our sin. If not, I'd be asking Andy, Bud, and Paul, and, and Rick, and a couple of you guys, hey, drag in the bull, and let's have a sacrifice. But we don't do that no more. That sacrifice is no longer required, that animal sacrifice, because Jesus, the Lamb of God, has been sacrificed for us at the cross. But, not but, but and on top of that, a sacrifice is required of you today. And that sacrifice is the sacrifice we just read. It's a sacrifice of praise that he wants you to bring to him. Especially on Sunday mornings, but also throughout the week. You can belt out hallelujahs and praise the Lord and thank you, Jesus, uh, on Sunday mornings and throughout the week. Now, God wants a, a sacrifice of praise from our hearts. But unfortunately, what we see in church today, not in our church, you, you guys, we belt it out. And we sing, but throughout churches, unfortunately, in some places I've been to, what we see is lifeless people staring at the worship team, and they're just spectators. There's no heart, there's no emotion, there's no expression, and there's no adoration. And it, it kind of turns into a show. It's not supposed to be that way, guys. It's, it's supposed to be you're, you're, you're praising the Lord throughout the week, and you're worshiping God, and Sunday's a culmination where we all come together and we praise the Lord together as this heavenly choir. I love it. And I heard it this morning, too. I heard it this morning during that final song, Blake. They were out singing you. I heard the fellowship singing louder than the worship team. And that's a great sign. That means that they're offering a sacrifice of praise. We need to view authentic worship, talking about on Sunday mornings now, the song part, as a sacrifice that you are presenting to the Lord. So yes, you're coming to church, you're coming to your place of worship on Sunday morning with a sacrifice. And you're saying, Lord, I'm coming before you and I'm ready to give a sacrifice of praise. I'm ready to let these lips sing out. I'm ready to do a little swaying if I want to or if you want to stand still, I'm fine with that too. If you want to lift your hands, if you want to praise the Lord, bring him a sacrifice of praise. Not to be religious or be external, but from the heart. From the heart, let's bring him a sacrifice of praise on Sunday mornings. 
Let's let it be vibrant. Let's let it be real. Let's let it be authentic. Lord, inhabit your praises. Let your consuming fire come down and consume our hearts, consume our lives. Uh, let, let, your, let your praise, let your authentic worship, the subject this morning, let it be robust. Let it be robust. If you want to belt out a hallelujah on Sunday mornings, you're not going to offend me. Okay? If you want to belt out a praise him, you're not going to offend me. Because why? Because we don't want the rocks to cry out. We don't want the rocks to cry out. We want to outcry them. We want to sing his praises. If you want to lift your hands, lift your hands. Now, it's important to say, if you want to lift your hands, lift your hands. But if you're not comfortable lifting your hands, that's fine. But just make sure your heart is in the right place. And that your lips are in the right place. And that you are singing praises, not from an outward perspective, but from an inward heart that loves Christ. Okay? It's this most important. You know, sometimes people can get carried away with emotional and physical expressions and their heart's not in the right place. It's very important in worship that we make sure that our heart is in the right place. That is a place of authentic worship. Family, I could dig a lot deeper into this passage. Even there, it says a sacrifice of praise. What does it say? To God. To God. That phrase is very important in that verse. Why? Because who is, is worship directed towards? Who is worship directed towards? Is it directed toward, looking at it from a worship team perspective, is the worship directed toward the people or is it directed toward God? It's directed toward the Lord. It's, it's just directed toward God. Now, again, don't, don't misunderstand me. There's a ministry component of worship that touches each and every believer's life, as, and, and they are ministered to by the worship music. But ultimately, and this should be a huge relief for the worship team, is Praise and worship is ultimately directed towards the Lord. It's directed towards God. You know, we're not necessarily here to please you. We are here to please him. And we invite you to enter in to that worship. So it's a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. You know, a lot of times on Sunday mornings, you know, it's, it's like the praise and worship team. Some, some people view it this way. It's like you're cranking a wheel. And they're trying to get the people going. They're trying to get them revved up. They're trying to get them excited. Trying to get them pumped up. And that's, that's, not, that's, not what, it's, that's not biblical church worship. The worship is the people come in and they offer up the sacrifice of praise. And then that ministry that takes place within the heart will prepare their heart for the word of God. Because it's done by the Spirit. Amen? Continuing on in our verse, verse 15. Is uh, he says, and this is this is what I call the heart of worship. This is this is the heart of praising the Lord and worshiping. It says that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to His name. The fourth element I present to you in this passage this morning, when it comes to authentic worship, is simple, guys. Don't overthink this. Okay, this is not rocket science. Giving thanks. Giving thanks. It's you simply coming before the Lord and saying, thank you. Thank you. That is an act of worship that your father is pleased with when you come to him and you say, thank you, God. And there's a million things you could thank him for. You could thank him for the sacrifice of Jesus. You could thank him for the um, forgiveness that you've experienced at the cross. You could thank him that you're going to spend eternity in heaven and not hell. That you're under grace and not judgment. That he's blessed your life. There's so many ways that you can thank him. But at the heart of being thankful, it's a, it comes from the heart. It comes from the heart again, not just from our lips. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The, the mouth just speaks what's in the heart. And our hearts need to be filled with praises because they are a heart filled with gratitude. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for you to be thankful, to live a life of thanks, to be thankful to God that he's, he's reached down and he's opened your heart. 
and he's saved you, and he's filled you with his Holy Spirit, and he's blessed you, and he's good, and he's given you life. Okay? Be thankful you are where you are right now. You don't have everything together, but guess what? Neither does the rest of us. We all have areas of our life and things that are happening in our life that maybe we're not happy about or things aren't going well, but we need to be thankful that he has rescued our heart. We need to be thankful. Um, so the heart of worship, according to verse 15, is the fruit of our lips giving thanks. And maybe you're thinking this morning, well, Pastor David, I, I just don't know what to be thankful for. I don't have anything to be thankful for this morning. If you're a believer, you have a lot to be thankful for. I got these. I'm going to give you six things that you could be thankful for. And they, they all come, come from, I'm not going to read the passage. You can go study it for yourself. But Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5, where the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, all, O my soul. And he says, Forget none of his benefits. But reasons for you to be thankful this morning and reasons for you to give praise to him. Number one, he is your creator. He is your creator. He fashioned you. He formed you. He's given you these eyeballs, these ears, this nose, this mouth. He's given you life. And he, he is your creator. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You were created by God. You are not a cosmic accident. Okay? So praise him because he is your creator. He's forgiven you. He's forgiven you. If you're a born-again Christian, he has washed you in the precious blood of the Lamb. He has washed you in the cross of Calvary and forgiven you of all sin, past, present, and future. That's another reason to thank him. Number three, he is Jeho Jehovah Rophi. He is our healer. He heals all our diseases. He brings healing to our soul. He brings healing to our physical body. Yes, I do believe in healing. I believe in physical healing. And he is the Lord that heals our diseases. Number four, number four, fourth reason to thankful. Instead of, a, instead of being on a highway to hell, you're on a highway to heaven because of the precious blood of the Lamb. The Bible says without the righteousness that comes from trusting in Christ, people will perish and spend eternity in hell. And that is a scary thought. But if you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has moved your eternal citizenship from hell to heaven. And that alone is worthy of praising him and being thankful that he has given you an eternity to spend with him in a place called the New Jerusalem, the third heaven, the holy city that Jesus talked about in John chapter 14, that Paul talked about in Corinthians, and that John talks about in Revelations chapter 21. He's given us the hope of heaven. Heaven is for real. Number five, he's shown you grace and mercy. When, when in reality, you know, we deserve judgment because we're, we are, we are uh, I'm speaking for myself, before Christ, I was a rebellious person. And even throughout my Christian walk, I find my heart wandering at times and, and wanting to rebel and go against the things of the Lord. And what does he do when, he, when I deserve judgment? He shows me grace and he draws me back to himself. There's another reason to be thankful. And ultimately, I believe we sang this song this morning, he is good. God is good. God is good. God is perfect. On Wednesday nights, we're studying Genesis chapter 1. And this past Wednesday, we looked at the um, five days of creation, and it was God is good. And what I was, as I was looking at each day of creation, God fashioned this world around, guess who? You. Each day of creation, you see the essential elements that are required for human life, okay? He has provided for us physically in this world a place to live, a place to uh, eat and given us life and he's provided for us a place in eternity and he's, 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 he's brought salvation to our souls and for that he is good and ultimately on the external outside as we see each other um, and you see your family and you see church members on a weekly basis praise looks good on you do you know that? the Bible says that Psalms 147 one says praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and praise, the NASB says, is becoming. That word becoming in Psalms 147 verse 1, talking about us praising the Lord, means it is beautiful. It is beautiful 
God looks down when he sees his children praising him. He says, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, appropriate, suitable thing. So family, let's live lives of authentic worship before our God and before our King. Let's not live lives around our traditions. Let's not live lives around religion and legalism and do's and don'ts. But let's live our lives in a, in, with a, uh, in authentic worship to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for how great he is and how magnificent he is in what he has done in our lives. So, verse 15, there, there, I, there I present to you. How, how do we worship? When we worship? What is worship? And heart of worship. Now, if you know your Bible, this is only half of worship. <laughs> you know, talking about praise and worship. There's another part that's even bigger uh, that you need to understand when it comes to worship. And that's found in the next verse. Let's look at the next verse, verse 16. Verse 16 says, And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Now, if you look there in verse 16, he calls this, in verse 16, a sacrifice. Okay? So we were talking about the sacrifice of praise now the author of Hebrews is talking about this is a sacrifice to God. What is a sacrifice to, to God? Verse, according to verse 16, doing good and sharing. What's he talking about there, Pastor? He's talking about the way you live your life and what you do with everyday living. The fifth and final element I present to you this morning, based on verse 16, is this, is, is, is that worship, authentic worship, is when you live a life of sacrifice and service to Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is also, I talked about a while ago, the, the heart of worship was the fruit of our lips giving thanks. This is the second element at the heart of worship, and that is that you live your life for the glory and honor of the Lord. That that's your deepest passion. And sometimes, sometimes we don't feel that passion. Sometimes we don't feel that desire. How do we get to that place of feeling that passion and that desire? Ask the Lord. Ask God. Say, Lord, I don't have this passion and this desire to live my life in a sacrifice of service to you. Pray. Pray. And say, Lord, help me to understand what Pastor David is talking about this morning and living a life in sacrifice and service to Christ Jesus. The apostle said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You and I, are not a dead sacrifice. We are a living sacrifice. In other words, our, our sacrifice, we don't get put on the brazen altar. You know, we don't get burned up and consumed like those lambs. We are a living sacrifice that lives all the days of our lives for the honor and glory of Christ Jesus. And then a holy, so it's a living sacrifice and it's a holy sacrifice. In other words, you're dedicated and you're committed to the Lord. You're committed to his word. You're committed to living a life of holiness and purity and dedication to him. And then he says at the end of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I know I don't have it on the screen, but write it down. But at the end of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, This is your spiritual service of worship. How do I offer myself, you may be thinking, how do I offer myself as a living and holy sacrifice? Give your life in service to the king. Now, does that mean I'm going to go off and be a missionary or go, go off and be a preacher? No, not necessarily. Or missionary? No. But it just means whatever allotment God has given you in this life, you're going to do it for his honor and his glory. Um, for those of you who work, take Christ to your work. Do it all for the glory and honor of God. Walk in integrity. Walk in honesty. If you're a school teacher or if you... You work at um, Savannah Riverside or wherever you work at in real estate. 
do it all for the honor and glory of the king and, and, and give your life as a sacrifice to him. Number two, how do we become a living sacrifice? Is be a witness. Share the gospel. Next Sunday, please do not miss next Sunday. Next Sunday, I am going to be presenting our vision to the fellowship for the year 2021, and it is going to be huge. We are going to be focusing on evangelism, and I'm going to lay out before the church um, a short passage from John chapter 3 and the gospel of Matthew. Yeah, that'd be good. And, um, and then we're going, to be t- we're going to be talking about our endeavors to share the gospel with the people of Irmo. We want, to, we want to be in the schools. We want to be in the neighborhoods. We want to be a witness. We want to be a living sacrifice to the Lord in, in being a witness. Thirdly, looking at verse 16, doing good to others. We do good to others in the name of Christ. We are here to help people. We are here to help people. I remember my pastor that ordained me. He said, David, at the end of the day, you go there to minister and you want to help people. You want to help people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want to help people in their everyday life. I want to help you guys become better followers of Christ Jesus in living for his honor and living for his glory. And we share. Verse 16 says, do not neglect doing good and sharing. You know, sharing our possessions, sharing our finances, sharing Jesus, being a giving people. Why? Because God has given to us. So that, so that fifth element is we live a sacrifice of service. We live, we live a life of sacrifice and service to Jesus Christ. This is at the heart of worship. Again, I hope for some of you this morning, this is opening your eyes. And this is just one portion, man. We could go over to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and break down those verses and see a lot more about worship. We could go and look at the book of Psalms and Proverbs and see a lot about worship. But we, we like to do verse by verse. We, we, we want to stick with what's being, being said here. But I hope and pray that you're understanding that worship is more than just singing songs. It, it is singing songs, and corporate worship is important. Man, we want to raise this roof with his praises. We want his glory and his spirit to come down. And that is worship. But remember, worship also takes place in your personal life Monday through Friday. So family, let's be a worshiping church. Let's be a, 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 a believers that seek passionately to experience the power of his Holy Spirit and growing in holiness, growing in sanctification, and being a people that worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So remember last week's message? It was authentic faith. Today's message, based on verses 15 and 16, is authentic worship. Let's be a people that worship the Lord in authenticity. And with that said, we will wrap up the book of Hebrews. Verse 17, verse 17 of uh, Hebrews um, chapter 13. He says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. How, do we, how does a pastor... How do leaders keep watch over souls? How do we do that? Several ways. One, it's our job to love and encourage and challenge the body of Christ. You know, when when the church gathers, when churches gather and people go to worship service, they're entrusting that pastor, that shepherd, to open up the word and they can, in a sense, kind of open their hearts up And say, okay, pastor, speak, of course, from scripture and teach me and show me the things of the Lord. So we're called to love and encourage with scriptures. We're called to have those difficult conversations. And at times, that's not very fun. But pastors and shepherds and leaders, we're we're called to have difficult conversations with with people when needed. Uh, we're card, we're call, car, card. We are called to guard the body from false teaching. And the best way to guard the body from false teaching is to stay in the word, is to teach the word in, in, in verse by verse manner that guards the body from false teaching. What brings, he talks about in verse, um, 
verse 17, he says, let them do this with joy. What brings a pastor joy? What brings me joy? Is when you see the word of God taking root in people's lives and they're growing. Man, I sleep like a, I, I, I sleep like a baby at night. I, I lay my head on my pillow at night when I hear testimonies within the body of Christ of people growing in their faith, growing in their relationship with the Lord. It just gives me such great joy to see believers growing. And that's, that's, that's my agenda here. You want to know the pastor's agenda <clears throat> at Calvary Chapel? It's to see you grow. To see you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then to see you love your neighbor as yourself. To see you love the people around you. To see you grow in your passion for Christ. To see you become a disciple of Christ. Man, that brings me joy. That brings me excitement. What brings me grief? What brings me grief is when you warn believers of the dangers of sin, and they do it anyway. And it's not in a judgmental fashion, but it's more of a heartbreaking fashion. It's more of a heartbreaking fashion. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you're taking care of your, of your children and you tell them, don't do this, don't do this, and they do it. And, and um, it breaks your heart. But that's what breaks my heart, is, is when I see my brothers and sisters in Christ uh, get pulled away from the Lord by sin and temptation. My heart breaks, and, and, I, and, I, and I do my very best to reach out to them in a spirit of grace and love and truth and encourage them to come back. But anyway, it says there, guys, obey your leaders and submit to them. If your leader, if your pastor is following Christ and he's following the word, man, follow your pastor, follow your leader. Um, as, as they live in life, an example, you can follow their example, as we saw last week in the opening of Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 18, verse 18 says, pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. This kind of gets connected, verse 18 gets connected to uh, verse 17. Because he's saying there in verse 18, the heart of the leader is what? To have a good conscience. And to, good, and con to conduct themselves in an honorable way. These are the kind of leaders we need within the body of Christ. Leaders are not perfect. Pastors are not perfect. But what we are called to do is to operate with a good conscience. Do what's in the best interest for the body without compromising our faith, without compromising the truth, and to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And then he says in verse 18, the, the admonishment to the body is what? Pray for us. So please pray for your pastor. Please pray for me. I need it. Our leaders need it. Please pray for all the pastors that you know, all the pastors of all the churches, that, that, that godly leadership in every church will lead their local bodies to the Lord. And as the leader follows Christ, pray for him. Verses 19, verse 19, um, we'll go 19 through 21. It says, and I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. There's the first evidence of Paul. I'm just throwing that out there. Verse 19. Verse 20, his benediction. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ. There's that phrase again. You see it all throughout the New Testament. Through Jesus Christ. Everything in your Christian life is through Jesus Christ. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He says there in verse 21, he says, Equip you in every good thing to do his will. God is the one who equips us for service. God is the one who gives us the ability to live for him. God is the one who gives us his spirit and enables us to live a victorious Christian life. God is the one who gives us the gifts for ministry within the body. You know, we don't like necessarily, we learn about our ministry gifts, but ultimately within the body, 
your gift that you bring to the body of Christ is a gift from the Lord that he has equipped you for. What gift has God given you to minister to the body of Christ? And also say, what gift has God given you to minister to in your family and in your community? God will give you the gifts. He, he will give you what it takes to do his will. Then he says in verse 22, he says, But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Love that phrase there in verse 22. He says, bear with this word of exhortation. You know, what he, you know what that phrase means? That means, hey guys, everything that you've read in this book, everything that you've learned in this chapter, receive it. Receive it, believe it, and trust it. Bear with this word. In other words, take it on completely. Let it soak into your heart. Let it soak into your mind these great and awesome Biblical truths from the scriptures. Bear with this word of exhortation. Verse 23, my second reason I believe Paul wrote this book. Now, I will, will say this. If you go search it, most people will say we're not exactly sure who the author of Hebrews was. But I, t I, lean, I lean, I'm going to use that word lean, towards the apostle Paul based on verses 19, 23, and 25. But the next one, Verse 23, he says, Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. When you look at, back at verse 19, he says, I urge you all the more to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So whoever the author of Hebrews is, he was imprisoned. He was imprisoned, and according to verse 23, he knew Timothy well. And we know from the rest of the New Testament that Timothy uh, was a disciple, uh, uh, a disciple up under the apostle Paul. So there's there's a close relationship. Whoever this person was, he was incarcerated, and he he lived. Uh, he knew Timothy and knew him well, and he calls him brother. That's a, that's a, a term of, of affection and endearment. So this person was very close to Timothy, and then he says in verse 24, "Greet all your leaders and all the saints." Those from Italy greet you. And here's the one. This is the one that, that really kind of makes me pretty sure. Verse 25. Typical Pauline greeting in the New Testament. If you go look at all of Paul's other letters, you'll see this exact same, uh, very similar phrase, words he used. And he says, grace be with you all. That was a very common phrase that the Apostle Paul used in many of his letters. Again, the book of Hebrews it doesn't identify who the author is, but a fascinating little cool thing about the book of Hebrews is, is most of the, all your New Testament books, they open up with who the author is. Paul or, 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 or um, James. But what does Hebrews open up with? Hebrews 1 1? God. <laughs> So God wrote the book, but who penned it? We're not 100% we're not sure, but possibly, um, maybe, I believe, Paul. But he says, grace be with you all. This is what I love about the Calvary Chapel movement, is our emphasis on grace. Now, why does Calvary Chapel emphasize grace? Why does Calvary Chapel emphasize grace? We emphasize grace because the Bible emphasizes grace. It's that simple. We understand that it's the grace of God that changes hearts. It's the power of the Holy Spirit bringing change to people's lives. And what people need more than anything is to experience God's amazing grace. God's amazing grace. Have you experienced God's amazing grace? Grace is that thing that God has that he shows to us and he changes our hearts and he shows us grace. Have you experienced God's grace? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, thank you for grace. And Lord, if there be anybody here this morning 
that has not experienced grace. And they desire to. Father, I pray that you would give them the faith this morning to put their trust in you, to turn from their sin and experience grace. This this amazing letter of the book of Hebrews, founded in Judaism, showing that Christ is the Messiah, the fulfillment of the law, it ends with grace. It ends with a reminder to grace. Lord, let us see that. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, Jesus said in John 3, 3, he said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again? What does born again mean? What does it, what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be an authentic follower of Christ Jesus? It can be summed up in three words. And again, if you're not a believer, this is for you. Number one, the first word, you must receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. John 1.12 says, for as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even those who, who believe on his name. To receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior means that you open your heart, you open your life, and you invite him in. And when you do that, that leads us to the second word. And that second word is repent. The word repent simply means to turn away from our old life, to turn away from sin. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Repentance simply means Apologize to God for your past. To turn from your wicked ways, to turn from the old life and turn to him. That's what repentance means. So it's receive, you ask him to come into your life. He gives you the ability to repent of your sins and then you put your trust in him. John three sixteen says, which I'll be preaching on next Sunday, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, here it is, believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What does it mean to believe? It means you believe in the cross. You put your trust in his sacrifice at the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you believe, as God said, that he raised his son from the dead. Have you put your trust in Christ Jesus? as your Lord and Savior. Have you? If you're you're here this morning and you haven't, I plead with you, what are you waiting on? God loves you. And God desires to give you a new heart. If that's you this morning, our prayer counselors are coming up now. They are there for you. They are there to pray for you and to lead you in a sinner's prayer, to lead you towards the Lord and becoming a Christian. That's the first reason they're there for, to lead people to Christ. The second reason is, um, body, this is for everyone. If you're here and you're going through a difficult situation, we want to pray for you. We want to minister to you. This, is, this could be called Holy Spirit ministry time, where we get to pray for you. And pray that the Spirit works in your life. But, if you, but again, if you're a part of the body and you're going through a difficult situation and you need special prayer, it could be for your family, it could be for your job, it could be for anything in life, please give us the opportunity to, to pray for you as we go into this time. So we'll be up front here to pray for you. Blake's going to lead us in a worship song. If you do come up to receive prayer for any reason, we will wear PPE hand sanitizer to keep everyone safe. God bless you guys.